Welcome to this overview of infrared thermography technology. The technology that actually allows us to see heat without requiring machinery shutdown. This program answers questions about the theory of heat and infrared thermography, how scanning systems work, typical applications and considerations for using this growing technology. Because heat, or the lack of it, can indicate emerging machine and equipment problems, infrared thermography can detect faults that elude other predictive maintenance technologies. Infrared thermography can be used to detect faults such as poor electrical connections and splices, steam leaks, temperature fluctuations in processes, cold spots in paper machine dryer rolls, valve or injector malfunction, overheated bearings, leaking seals, refractory breakdown, building energy and heat loss, build up roof leaks, and problems in transformers, distribution panels, motor stators and rotors, as well as determining levels in tanks. In the field of thermography, a fault is usually referred to as an anomaly or nonconformity. That is, it doesn't meet the standard. The list of faults then could be called a list of anomalies. In order to get the most from infrared technology and determine whether an application will be effective, it is necessary to understand the theory behind it. The infrared technology measures the heat or radiation from certain wavelengths of the electromagnetic spectrum. The visible light, or colors we see, are only a part of the same electromagnetic spectrum. The prism separates light into its distinct frequency bands and shows the color range for the band. Actually, there are many more wavelengths, but these are the ones visible to the naked eye. These other electromagnetic waves were discovered in 1800 by Sir William Herschel, royal astronomer to King George III of England. While using a blackened thermometer to measure the temperatures of each color of the spectrum produced by the sunlight passing through a prism, he noticed that the temperatures increased well past the area of the visible spectrum before dropping again. He referred to this range of the spectrum as the thermometrical spectrum. The term infrared was coined about 75 years later. Infra meaning below or the area immediately below the red area of the spectrum. Beyond infrared is the region of microwaves and then the radio waves, the UHF, VHF and the ULF. At the other end of the visible spectrum is the color violet. The wavelengths just above violet are referred to as ultraviolet. Above that are X-rays and then gamma rays. Over the course of time, special sensors have been developed that are particularly sensitive to electromagnetic waves in the range of infrared, which is from 0.75 microns to 1,000 microns or 1 millimeter. These sensors or detectors are incorporated into special cameras so that infrared images can be viewed and continuously updated in real time. The first of three primary sensor types is the pyroelectric viticon. It uses a vacuum tube with crystals as its sensor. Movement activates the crystals and causes them to stand up, allowing the electromagnetic waves to pass through, producing an image on the rear of the tube. One characteristic of the crystals is they stand up only momentarily when movement is detected. For non-changing images, a chopping of the seam must be performed or the image will fade out. A second type of detector is the single element detector. This detector is similar to the CCD chip in a video camera. As the infrared energy strikes the detector, an electric output is generated and the scene is produced. These chips can be sensitive to either the short or long waves of the infrared energy. The third type of detector is the focal plane array. It is actually many single element detectors working in unison. Since the chips are very small, they can be mounted on a surface with say 512 high by 512 across. The area can have as many as 2000 by 2000 or 4 million chips acting in unison. An array of chips produces the highest quality image of all the infrared cameras on the market. Many of the detectors used in a single element or focal plane array must be cooled to obtain the response needed to provide a high resolution image and accurate temperature measurements. The cooling can be through a compressed gas, liquid nitrogen, a Stirling closed cycle cooler, or thermoelectric cooling. 
Whatever the cooling method, a consistent temperature in the camera must be maintained for the best accuracy. The signal generated by any of these detectors is typically converted into a video signal so the image can be viewed on a monitor or recorded onto videotape. This allows storage of these images for later comparisons or reporting. Choose the camera that produces the best image and it fits into your budget. Remember that higher cost does not automatically equate to a better quality image. The goal of a thermographer is to detect heat differentials and determine specific temperatures. With a good quality camera, temperatures can be determined within a tenth of a degree. The camera system we are using here, and for most of the images used in this program, is the CSI Model 9000 thermography camera. It uses a thermography camera with a focal plane array technology which can be used as a standalone unit. This system uses three other components that are needed primarily for documenting and reporting. The 8mm video camera provides a visible picture of the scanned equipment for comparison and recognition. Signals from both cameras are sent to this miniature color video recorder, where the infrared image or visible image can be displayed and recorded. An electronic pen-based computer provides a means to write any notes which will then be stored with the image and downloaded to the computer. Whatever system you use, there are certain considerations that must be made in order to make accurate temperature measurements. Remember that the infrared camera is used to look at objects that may be hot, cold, or near ambient temperature, and that it actually views the radiated energy. This radiated energy can be real and provide an accurate representation of the object. However, the radiated energy can be reflected from another source and provide invalid images and temperatures. To illustrate this, let's use three cans that are each marked with several colors of tape. The first can will fill with hot water. The second can will leave empty. And the third can with ice. and cold water. Here the colors of tape are clearly evident using a normal camera that is sensitive to the visible light. Now the viewing screen is split showing the visible light on one side and the infrared image on the other. Although the infrared image can be displayed in color, where the brightest or whitest spots indicate the hottest temperatures, most seasoned thermographers use a grayscale or black and white image to more accurately determine the levels of brightness. Here we are using a grayscale image, where the hottest temperatures are lightest and colder temperatures are progressively darker. So the hot can appears light and the cold can is dark. The empty can is some temperature between. All the tapes appear to be the same color for each can because they are actually the same temperature as the can. On the back of each can, however, are three more tapes. One is gray, one is white, and one is silver. In the normal light sensitive camera, these colors appear distinct. The infrared image also clearly shows one tape on each can is different from the others, which indicates a temperature difference. On the hot can, the silver tape appears to be colder than the other tapes. On the cold can, the silver tape appears to be the hottest. What causes this? Are the silver tapes actually a different temperature? The tapes on a can really are the same temperature, but let's look at them more closely to determine the cause of the apparent temperature difference. Notice that the white and gray tapes appear the same color or temperature, and they both have the same textured surface. However, the silver tape has a smooth or reflective surface. This reflective surface is actually reflecting the ambient temperature of the room, or background temperature, and therefore does not radiate or emit the true temperature. Every object differs in the way it emits the true heat or infrared energy. This emitting is called emissivity and is a unit of measure which can be thought of as an efficiency factor. Determining the emissivity of an object is the first consideration in thermographic imaging. 
All objects are rated on their emissivity. A perfect emitter has a value of one and is called a black body. In the real world, there are no perfect emitters or black bodies, but all objects have a fractional value and are called gray bodies. Manufacturers furnish a table of emissivities for various materials. This table shows emissivities of some common materials. With one being a black body or perfect emitter, notice that human skin has a value of 0.98 or 98% of the value of a black body. Iron oxide has an emissivity of 0.89 and lower on the scale are rolled sheet steel, building brick, cast iron, and polished aluminum. All objects have some reflectivity as well as emissivity. Mathematically, a perfect black body has an emissivity of one, or E equals one. All gray bodies must account for both emissivity and reflectivity, so the equation now is one equals E plus R, where E is emissivity and R is reflectivity. In our example of the cans with the tapes, the silver tape is the same temperature as the others, but its reflectivity causes it to appear as another temperature. Since the reflectivity affects the emissivity, the camera must compensate for the reflective background in order to obtain the accurate temperature. Other characteristics of some materials must be considered when making accurate temperature measurements. To illustrate, we will again view the cans but put a piece of thin dark plastic over the lens of both cameras. The visible light image is black, but the infrared camera produces a clear image of the cans. Why doesn't the camera see the plastic film? If the plastic is doubled, the image of the cans is still evident, although somewhat diminished. Doubling the plastic again causes the image to be darker still. Each time the plastic is doubled, less of the image is apparent, that is, less of the infrared energy is transmitted through it. Like emissivity, this transmitted energy must be compensated for in order to produce accurate temperature measurements. Now the formula must include this transmitted energy, so the complete formula is 1 equals E plus R plus T, where E is emitted energy, R is reflected energy, and T is transmitted energy. There are only a few objects that transmit infrared energy, but most are opaque, so that usually it is not necessary to compensate for transmitted energy. This allows us to adopt the simpler formula of 1 equals E plus R. Some objects have surprising characteristics. Let's use this sheet of glass, for instance. When it is placed in front of the cameras, the visible light energy is transmitted easily, but the infrared energy is substantially decreased. Sheet plastics like plexiglass are very similar, depending on the thickness and chemical makeup. This means that when scanning from an aircraft, one of two things must occur. The door or window must be opened, or the camera must be mounted outside the aircraft cabin. When performing a thermal scan, there may be times when the area to be scanned is not accessible. In these cases, a mirror can be used, and then the reflected energy can be measured. Most mirrors have the reflective surface behind the glass, though, which causes the energy to be transmitted through the glass twice, once going to the reflective surface and once coming back from the reflective surface to the camera. We have already determined that glass does not transmit infrared energy well, so this would not provide an accurate temperature. The solution is to use a mirror called a first surface mirror, which has the reflective surface on the front side of the glass. This first surface mirror allows the infrared energy to reflect the energy emitted from the object and provide an accurate temperature measurement. Other considerations must also be made to determine accurate temperature measurements. Because thermography is the plotting or graphing of heat energy, we need to understand some principles of heat and its movement, or thermodynamics, in order to determine the effects on heat measurements. A law of thermodynamics says that heat will move to regions of cold until the temperature is at a state of equilibrium. The greater the temperature difference, the faster the heat transfers. Actually, there is no such thing as cold. Cold is only the absence of heat energy. There are three ways that heat moves from one area to an area of less heat. 
One way is conduction, that is, the heat transfers through a solid. An example of this is the heat from a stove eye heating the bottom of a pot first, and then gradually heating the sides. In industry, an example would be a bearing overheating and then heating the surrounding housing and the piece of equipment, or heat generated from a loose electrical connection heating the wire for a distance. The second method of transferring heat is called convection. Convection is the transfer of heat through a liquid. Whenever we think of liquid, we think of water or some other fluid. However, air is also considered to be a liquid. A typical example is the cooling system in an automobile. The heat from the engine is transferred to the liquid coolant. The coolant is then pumped through a radiator where air crosses the radiator, transferring heat to the air, which leaves the liquid coolant much cooler. The third method of transferring heat is called radiation. The biggest source of radiation in our world is the sun. It emits or radiates heat energy, and every object this heat energy strikes either absorbs or reflects it to some degree. In industry, it is the source of this heat transfer or radiation that we want to view and measure with our thermography technology. The next few sections illustrate measuring the radiated heat from various sources and recommend steps of action that help avoid making wrong measurements. Thermography in industry today is most often used for detecting electrical anomalies. Common applications include electrical panels, splices, cable trays, junction boxes, phase balancing, overloading, as well as transformers, switch yards, and even transmission lines. The first and major consideration when scanning electrical equipment is safety. Always use extreme caution and make sure the personnel with you are qualified and familiar with the equipment to be surveyed. Besides safety, there is another consideration that should be made when scanning for electrical faults. Most electrical circuits are designed to operate at 80% of the capacity. This allows a conservative temperature rise, which is still well within the safety margin. When the load or current draw is less than 80%, the temperatures and the current may be carried across poor connections or even a wire that has broken strands without heating excessively. Perform your scans while the electrical system has at least a normal current load. Avoid scanning at reduced loads. When scanning closed panels, some may appear to be hotter than others. But remember that you are to determine the source of heat. Is this really radiated heat or could it be reflected heat? If you can visibly see a bright spot or reflection, it will cause a thermal pattern. Is the heat from the cover itself or has it become hot due to conduction or convection of internal heat? Have qualified personnel open the box for better inspection. Depending on the type of panel, there may be large lug connections, fuses, breakers, or a throw switch. When connections of any type are loose, heat is generated because loose connections cause electricity to jump or arc across the joint. Arcing heats the joint and can cause pitting. Another reason for the excessive heat is that the loose connection acts similar to a wire or cable that is sized too small for the load. It is attempting to carry more electricity than the touching surfaces can allow. Excessive heat is generated when a lug is not tied on the wire, or a fuse is not tied in the holder or any other connection. There is usually some general concern for splices that are made in cables and should be checked for hot spots. The excessive heat generated by any loose connections can cause hot spots, overheat wires which breaks down the insulation and can cause other shorts in the system. When a loose connection is suspected, it is important to pinpoint the exact location. If the entire area is bright or hot, turn down the iris on the camera until only the hottest point is bright. This will be the exact source of the heat and most likely the location of the loose connection. A wire or cable that has too much load can be confused for a loose connection. One way to distinguish between the two is an overload tends to heat the entire length of the wire, while a loose connection is localized and generates a hot spot. These additional examples of various overloads and loose connections illustrate the difference. Notice how some wires are hot their entire length, indicating an overload, and others cool down over a short distance.
Stranded wires or cables can have a break in some of the strands, which forces the load to be carried on the remaining strands. When this occurs, the good strands are usually forced to carry too much current and cause excessive heat. The broken strands will be much cooler, and the thermal image will appear as barber pole striping or candy striping. Loose connections, overloading, and broken strands each have their own unique characteristics, which can be distinguished in a thermography image. Whether the temperature is within tolerance or even measured may not be of any concern here. The fact that there is an anomaly requires action. When scanning a panel or junction box, the temperatures may all be within tolerances. There are no connections, bad fuses or breakers, and yet there is still an obvious anomaly. This problem is that of uneven phases. Since most industrial facilities use three-phase power, there will be three phases or legs going to machinery and equipment. A problem in the stator of a motor can cause one leg or phase to draw more or less current. In most applications, the phases should all have approximately the same load and therefore the same temperatures. One leg that is hot indicates uneven phases, and other tests should be performed to determine the actual source of the problem. Transformers are designed to operate at 100% capacity. Since most of them do operate at or near capacity, it is imperative that they are in good condition. Most transformers require some form of cooling due to the excessive heat they generate. The cooling is normally an oil bath that uses convection to carry heat to the cooling fins. The unit must not overheat or it may explode, sending contaminants into the environment. A common cause of overheating is the coolant oil may build up a sludge and clog some of the cooling fins. This example of a large transformer has some clogged fins, which is indicated by the cold or dark regions. A good cooling fin or tube should be warmer at the top and colder at the bottom. Other types of transformers can exhibit hot spots caused by internal breakdown of the transformer. Additional tests should be performed to confirm the level of degradation. Switch yards can be inspected from the ground with the best result being achieved at night just after sundown. Hot spots are usually the focus and the night cooling enhances this, making them much easier to locate. Components in a switch yard include switches, fused disconnects, transformers, capacitors, wire, bus or terminal bars, oil or gas circuit breakers, and reclosures. Remember that some hot spots may be naturally occurring in some equipment due to internally mounted strip heaters used to keep on moisture. Transformers and capacitor banks are naturally warm. On these, the presence of cold spots could indicate an anomaly. All wires should be at or near ambient temperature with no more than a 3 degree centigrade rise. Wires warmer than that could indicate an undersized wire or an overload condition. Remember that here too, wires that have a barber pole striping or candy striping indicate some broken strands with the unbroken wires carrying the total load. In switch yards, the hot spots can be at such a distance that they may be difficult to detect and a telescopic lens would be very helpful. View the hot area from other positions to pinpoint the source of the hot spot. Some mechanical problems can be clearly seen with a thermal image. When a bearing degrades or there is inadequate lubrication, the friction generates heat, which can show up as a hot area at the bearing housing or bearing mounting location. Remember that for most oil lubricated bearings, the oil breaks down at 160 degrees Fahrenheit. Bearings that are in this range are too hot. Misalignment is a fault that is easily recognizable using thermal imaging. The easiest place to spot misalignment is at the coupling. A series of tests was performed on a motor generator set using various couplings in alignment and four amounts of misalignment. Each setup was run for four hours and then thermal images were recorded. Both the aligned condition and misaligned condition are shown here for each coupling type. Notice how the aligned coupling remained cool while the misaligned condition is clearly hotter. Depending on the coupling type, 
the difference between an aligned condition and a misaligned condition is as much as 65 degrees Fahrenheit. It should be noted that the amount of misalignment shown in these examples is very minor and definitely not considered gross misalignment. Belts are commonly used in most manufacturing facilities, but can generate excessive vibration when they are carried on eccentric or misaligned shivs. Since belts rely on friction to work, they will generate some amount of heat. However, misaligned shivs cause the belts to ride up on one side, causing more heat on that side of the V-groove. The thermal image will indicate this misaligned condition. The thermal image of a multiple belt drive will indicate some temperature variations among the belts due to differences in tension. Some manufacturing processes require specific and uniform temperatures in order to maintain high quality. Thermal imaging can provide the information needed to correct problems and increase quality production. This example shows the paper from a paper machine as it is being rolled up. It has just come from the dryer section where it should have dried uniformly, yet there is definite streaking indicating a cold area. This area did not dry thoroughly, which points to a problem with the drying process. This example is a coating process where the coating slides off a roll and coats the product. Tons of the product were rejected because the coating did not meet the requirements. The thermal image makes it clear that the coating does not maintain a uniform temperature as it is dispensed, and this caused the irregularities in the product. Many facilities have processes where heat is used for the process and must be contained. It could be a furnace for a boiler, an oven to cure or cook a product, a kiln, steam pipes, or some other hot area. Insulation panels on the walls must prevent the outside surface temperatures from exceeding limits as set forth by OSHA. Breakdown of the insulation or seals of the closures is easily detectable with thermal imaging. Open joints between the internal refractory panels are easily recognizable. Be sure to record accurate surface temperatures for reporting so precautions can be made to protect personnel. Storage tanks have their own set of peculiarities and sometimes present special challenges, one of which is determining the product level. If the tank is outdoors, survey it at night when the air cools the tank down to the product level. The contents will be warmer and indicate a definite thermal differential. If the survey must be performed in daylight hours, choose a sunny day when the sun heats up the tank surface, but the product does not absorb the heat quickly and will indicate a cooler temperature. Thermographers complain that it takes too long to compile the information and get a report back to the customer. Customers complain about a three or four week turnaround time. A good system documents the essentials and takes the headache out of the paperwork. The notes are already electronically recorded in the field, which will spare many hours trying to sort notes, find notes, or recall information. The information is downloaded to the computer into CSI's InfraAnalysis software, where a database of records and images are kept for each machine. The database stores the machine or equipment name and description, the fault location, the surveyor's name, and temperature information including the exception temperature, the reference temperature, the background temperature, ambient temperature, the delta temperature, and the full load delta temperature. Electrical parameters can also be recorded for the phase leg or circuit number, the voltage, the actual load in amps, the rated full load, and the percentage of the full load. Based on your findings, you must recommend a course of action for correcting the anomalies. These can be stored in an area for recommended actions. All of this documents your work, but the customer wants to see the picture or thermal image and in color. Individual frames of the video footage are digitized and stored on the computer where we can retrieve and view them. The pictures can then be printed as part of the report. The report can also be put into a slideshow on a disk and given to the customer. The customer simply views the visible and thermal images at his convenience. And since all the information and recommendations are included, you have a happy customer. 
And that's all in a day's work. Let's take a look at some special considerations you'll need to know. When performing thermography surveys, Earlier in the program, we showed you examples of performing outdoor surveys. These require special consideration due to the sun's heat and wind, which can be used to benefit you, but if not understood, can lead to wrong conclusions. The sun radiates heat to objects or surfaces, which will either absorb or reflect the heat. The heat absorption is called solar gain or solar loading. This is evident at night when viewing an object like a telephone pole. It should be the same temperature on all sides. However, it absorbed energy where the sun rays hit it, and now it is releasing or radiating that heat back to atmosphere. This causes the pole to appear striped. This solar loading can be used to your benefit in some applications, like roof surveys, where you are looking for wet insulation. The dry roof radiates its solar gain much faster than the wet areas, causing the wet areas to appear much warmer. Solar reflections are just that, reflection of the sun or atmosphere. A reflective surface or one of a low emissivity value will cause you to actually measure the sun or whatever it is reflecting. At night, the reflective surface will appear much colder since it is reflecting the cold atmosphere. When you are scanning during daylight or dark, if you can visibly see a bright spot or reflection, then the same shape will be in the thermal image. In the sunlight, it may be difficult to determine whether the spot is a reflection. The reflective temperature could mask an anomaly. For this reason, most outdoor scanning is performed at night. The wind is another consideration that affects your temperature readings. Wind can blow the heat waves away and cause an object to appear much cooler. When scanning the exterior of a building for heat loss, wind will affect your measurements. When solar gain, reflection, or wind are present, be sure to note it well enough that another person could perform the scan and achieve the same results. Earlier in this program, in our discussion on emissivity, we mentioned that gray bodies need to be compensated for to bring their values up to one in order to achieve an accurate temperature measurement. For example, if the actual temperature of an object is 100 degrees and its emissivity is 1, the thermal image will indicate 100 degrees. If the emissivity is 0.95, then it would display 95 degrees. If the emissivity is 0.4, it would indicate a temperature of 40 degrees. We would need to compensate for the poor emissivity so the indicated temperature would be the actual temperature. The camera allows us to plug in a value for the emissivity, then it will make the correction and display the actual temperature. There are three ways to determine the emissivity. One is to use the tables provided by the manufacturer. These tables are really estimations and the least accurate of the three methods. The second is to use a black body as a reference, and the third is to use a known temperature for comparison. Either of the last two will provide accurate results. Plug in the numbers and the temperatures will be accurate. Earlier we showed you that infrared energy is in the range of 2 microns to 1,000 microns. The infrared cameras are not sensitive to the area above 14 microns. And the first 14 microns are divided so that one group is referred to as long wave and the other as short wave. Actually, the short waves are considered to be in the range of 2 microns to 5.6 microns. The long waves are from 8 microns to 14 microns. This leaves an obvious gap from 5.6 to 8 microns. This region is not used because energy here is absorbed by the atmosphere and is not available to us. The camera that is sensitive to the shortwave region is better for high temperatures and is not as susceptible to night sky reflections. This means it would be best for surveying roofs of buildings and any high temperature processes that use refractory ovens or hot chemical processes. The long-wave cameras are best for ambient temperatures and less sensitive to solar reflection. They would be best for performing daytime scans of switchyards or electrical applications that are not subject to extreme heat. Use the wavelength that is best for your application.
We have provided an historical background and highlighted some of the common uses and characteristics of the infrared thermographic imaging. Whether troubleshooting or performing routine PDM surveys, you'll find many more applications for this growing technology. Thank you for joining the thousands who have selected CSI training for PDM and RBM application training. We are confident that the application tips and techniques presented here will help you in your infrared thermography analysis. We look forward to assisting you achieve success in your future endeavors.